Welcome to the World Bank Praxis Discussion Series. I'm Oscar Sabakti. I'd like to welcome our audience here in Sydney and those watching on APAC online and listening on radio and everyone watching in Dili, Honiara and Port Moresby. And don't forget, you can follow the discussion on Twitter using the Pacific Praxis hashtag. Well, this month, Papua New Guinea celebrated 40 years of independence, providing an opportunity to reflect on how far the nation has come and to consider the challenges that lay ahead. As the Pacific's largest country in size, population and economy, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill believes PNG is entering a period of change never experienced before. Papua New Guinea is also securing its role in the region as not just an economic leader, but as a driver of the broader regional policy agenda, which will be on display when the nation hosts the APEC Forum in 2018. The nation also recently hosted the successful Pacific Islands Games and the Pacific Islands Forum, which is now chaired by Prime Minister O'Neill. So what lies ahead for PNG? Will the government's 2050 vision plan take PNG forward? And how will the nation continue to cement its position as a regional leader? Well, joining us to discuss these issues and more are Benedict Imbun, Senior Lecturer at Western Sydney University. Franz Dies Gross, the World Bank Country Director for Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Islands. Cecilia Nembu, Associate Professor of Management and Vice President at PNG's Divine Word University. And Dean Waruba, PhD candidate at Western Sydney University. Thank you all for joining us. So as we all know, um, PNG has celebrated 40 years since uh, it became independent from Australia. Some of you went back home to, to witness the celebrations for yourself. Cecilia, if I could start with you. You were there, you lived there obviously. How, how were the celebrations? The celebrations were exciting. Uh, exciting in the sense that everyone was engaged in it, from the little children up to the adults. I think you know, we have come to states where the people actually are together. When it comes to big celebrations like the Pacific Games and the independence, the, the people are together. They actually um, show this sense of unity. When we, we, we pride ourselves of unity in diversity. You feel that during our major celebrations. So I, it, it was, it, everyone was involved. I'm, I'm particularly impressed with the school children. The schools actually um, get the children to dress up in their traditional costumes. And the day before independence, that day is not, you know, it's, it's actually taken up for cultural activities and displaying their um, national pride in dressing up in their tra traditional costumes. So it was great. Excellent. Benedict, um, you and Cecilia are among, I guess, the first generation of those who are around um, since independence. Forty years on, uh, paint us a picture of how the country is at the moment. Well, I can relate to myself. I mean, uh, 1975, I was uh, 10 years, 11 years old, doing grade five or six, five or four around that time. And, uh, you know, there was excitement, euphoria, but very little communication. We were getting independence, uh, some of them said we were getting underpants from Australia. Or, so there wasn't that uh, excitement in a sense uh, that uh, they were, we were looking forward to something, but that something was oddly, you know, and it could be explained. But I went to high school, if I can relate it all along, things became clearer, high school to I could get a job because I came from a village, I attended a missing school. Came to the university, then started uh, university, and then became an academic in the process. Came to Australia, attended a few universities here, and went back. So in that short span of time, I mean, I could see we have achieved. I mean, if I'm a testimony to that, uh, forty years, uh, you know, from a village level, coming, acquiring education along the year, years, and then teaching here, teaching Australians for that matter, the, uh, you know, the subject they like, industrial relations. <laughs> Uh, you, you could see we have achieved, achieved a lot, I mean, with, uh, with, with that, uh, but still we have a lot to do. I mean, as we, the discussion goes on, I mean, surely others can explain and we can uh, mm. talk more. So uh, we have achieved. Excellent. In terms of human resource uh, development, yeah, and but yes. there are more work to be done. That's right, and we will look into those challenges yeah. a little later in the discussion. But Dean, you weren't around, obviously, when um, PNG gained independence. But from when you were born and from, from your experience in the country, uh, how have you seen PNG develop um, since it did become independent on its own? Oh, um, 
When I was born, we had already been independent for about six years. And at that time when I started primary school, I remember on every Wednesday for Mufti Day, I uh, wore a tree bark with leaves. Here I am sitting in this conference in the biggest city in the Southern Hemisphere, <laughs> studying a PhD and talking to you. <laughs> so you've seen a lot of development in such a short amount of time. Yes. Mm. It is hard to believe, isn't it, that it has only been 40 years. And you look at a country like Australia in excess of 200 years, uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot of, uh, still a long way to go, as Ben, you said. And uh, we will talk about that um, now, I guess. Can I ask you, Franz, uh, from the World Bank perspective, obviously uh, there is a particular focus uh, on PNG. Can you just explain to us what you see as the achievements, I guess, uh, that PNG has, has um, acquired over the recent years? Well, let me just say, at, at 40 years, it is a historic milestone for PNG. and it's, It behooves us to look back and, and to focus on some of the things that have gone well, first of all. Um, for one thing, PNG now is richer than it was, significantly richer than it was at Independence. At Independence, average incomes in PNG in 1975 were about $1,500 per person. We're now at $2,400 per person. And while that rate of growth from 1,500 to 2,400 isn't staggering, certainly not by, by uh, East, East Asia standards, it is a significant improvement. The economy is not only bigger, it's much more diverse than it was 40 years ago. You know, at Independence, there was one big uh, mine, that's Panguna in Bougainville. Now there's quite a few of them. There's a number of large mines. There were no natural gas developments at all in PNG. Now there's a huge $19 billion natural gas export project. At Independence, agriculture meant basically cocoa, coffee, tea, and copra. Um, now, in addition to those sectors, um, you have tuna processing, for example. Coffee is 60% uh, bigger than it was in 1975. Cocoa is 25% bigger. So they're not hugely bigger, but they're somewhat bigger. Um, and there's some others, just some human development, I think, milestones that are impressive. I mean, um, Ben just mentioned, it, it just came to mind, that he was in primary school in 1975. Well, if he was in primary school, he was one of only 50% of primary school age kids that were in primary school in 1975. Today, 96% of primary school age kids are in school. So that's a huge achievement. The number of kids actually going to school especially in primary school, has increased significantly, and that's a relatively recent development. So looking back, there are you know, a number of substantial achievements over the last 40 years. Cecilia, if I could ask you, uh, Franz just mentioned there uh, the, I guess, the development of the education sector in the country. That's a particular passion of yours. Why do you believe education is so important in your country? Um, let me begin by saying I, I, I actually graduated with a, my bachelor's degree um, six weeks before independence. So I've been working for 40 years while PNG is 40 years. Uh, I, I believe very much that everything depends on education. Singapore has demonstrated this very well. A number of other countries have got on board. Um, Finland, I believe, in Europe, or is it Switzerland? Um, that the development of the people is very much necessary. You cannot do anything else um, without educating your people. And I believe um, the, the developments that, or if there are any, and the, the, the drawbacks in our, our development at the moment have got to do with our level of education. We have come a long way. Um, at Independence we had two universities, now we have six. We have a, a, an increasing number of, of, of tertiary institutions. So that sector is growing, but still the there's a lot of room for improvement. So, yes, um, the number of graduates coming out of university has grown since independence. Uh, but I would like to see more graduates coming out of university. In order for us to, with our, uh, our 2050 vision, with the seven pillars, number one is not by accident that number one is human development, um, youth and, and uh, yeah, human capital, youth and, and people empowerment, because you need to educate the people in order that you can do anything else. Mm -hmm. Yet to defend our country, we need educated people. The army has got to be educated. The police have got to be educated. The reason our agriculture is behind is because the people do not know, you know the science of 
uh, uh, cash cropping and things like that. And we'll ask Dean in a moment about the agriculture sector because that is a particular area of interest to you. But in terms of the education system, am I right in saying that primary and secondary education at the moment is free for Papua New Guineans, but you're saying that there's a, a bottleneck after, after grade 12, uh, there's a lack of options, is that correct? Yes, but the development has been such that in the colonial days, education was free. And there was, at that level, there was a universal primary education. Then fees were introduced, and when fees were introduced, parents, village people couldn't afford, as you know, 85% of our people are in rural areas, um, they couldn't afford school fees. So the, the, that the education level slowed down. Government has just recently realized that, and in the last year or so, they brought in the new policy on, on fee-free education. They, they have yet to come to terms with what all that means. For example, yes, there, there are hundreds and thousands of children now who want to go to school. Parents want them to go to school. But there's not enough classroom space. There are not, not enough teachers to go around. Yeah. So there are some issues with seeing, seeing the implications of policy making before those, the policy decisions are taken. But yeah, we are getting there. Mm. And I think uh, to quote uh, uh, what you quoted previously, so the, the country is at the moment seeing 20,000 graduates from grade 12, but there are only 5,000 tertiary spots available for them. So clearly the tertiary sector is, is an area that needs to be developed. But Ben, can I ask you, uh, you're um, an expert in the employment sector mm -hmm. in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Even if the country manages to provide these 20,000 graduates with the equivalent number of tertiary spots, will there be jobs for them at the end of it? Yeah, well, there would be a challenge, I mean, aptly, uh, given that uh, the extractive sector is actually the most uh, dominating sector you know, next to agriculture. Uh, but the, the extractive sector is more capital intensive, fly and fly out consultants, miners based in Cairns. So, they come to, so there is a little trickle down effect that would uh, trigger the economy to sustain or provide more employment opportunities. So although the government has gone, you know, hugely in favor of, uh, you know, the human capital or human resource development, uh, uh, alternatively on the other side, uh, they haven't actually done much more on the labor market side uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, youth empowerment or uh, labor market uh, initiatives or to have job, uh, uh, particularly in the agriculture sector. So that's where the mismatch is, that's where the challenges are, uh, probably down the line. After having a cohort of, uh, core group of uh, all these educated people around, uh, putting pressure on the government, then obviously gradually they would come to realize that they need to create jobs. That's where the missing link is. Uh, and uh, obviously, I mean, a lot of Papua New Guineans have uh, migrated as well, particularly with the extractive uh, sector. A lot of them work here, but that's in relation to the demand for skills and other things. But although, uh, <laughs> eighty percent of everybody or hundred percent everybody is contained in the economy, but the uh, courtesy of the subsistence mm -hmm. sector, because there's probably a thousand jobs are created annually by the PNG labour market. So if twenty thousand people are not absorbed in the formal system in terms of uh, feathering the Education, uh, obviously, the one talks or the relatives or the subsistence sector is absorbing them. So that's a huge challenge for the government Interesting. of the day on the, you know, the subsequent government. Okay, so job creation is another mm, that's challenge. Right. Uh, Dean, now, as I mentioned, agriculture is a particular area of expertise for yourself. And you mentioned, uh, Cecilia mentioned that one of the challenges is to educate uh, the people who are currently in agriculture about, I guess, better ways to better techniques for their industries. I is that a problem in your, in your view? <coughs> Firstly, well, agriculture in Papua New Guinea evolved independently from the rest of the world some 10,000 years ago. Um, with that, we've had our own practices of how we farm. In my opinion, that, is, that now needs to change if we are to move forward. Um, agriculture that we need is, say, cash crops, where you're monoculture, where you're cropping cocoa, or if it's intercropping, it's just two crops. But not like before, where there's a bit of taro, banana, cassava, and we're only planting perishables, things that we can't store. So 
Thus, when we have a situation like we're going through now with the um, El Nino, we can't store because we're not producing crops that we can store in later. We can't produce crops that we can store in, and sustain us now. To get our people to appreciate cash cropping, um, they have to understand what it is for. At the moment, in my opinion, we're seeing these cash crops as a means to an end. I'm planting cocoa because I need to build this house. The moment I put the tin roofing up, I go back to doing my own thing until, okay, I need to <coughs> buy a generator. I go back to my cocoa garden, clear it up, and then go again. This is the mentality that we need to change if we're to move forward, if we're to keep a constant supply of our produce, to maintain the economy, to drive and stimulate our economy. But agriculture still has a big, big important, I mean, important role to play. 87, well, more than 85% of our population rely on agriculture. In the rural communities, they rely on nothing but agriculture. Mm -hmm. It is a very fundamental key in our development moving forward, in our vision 2050, in the pillars that we have. I think agriculture is a uh, cross-cutting thematic theme that you could probably answer three of those pillars for development and moving forward. And it will be... If, our, if we achieve our vision, agriculture will play a very vital role, and agriculture and natural resource development, a very vital role in where we'll be 50 years from now. And I'm excited about it because I hope to be part of it. Excellent. And Franz, you were recently in Papua New Guinea. What were your observations? You listed some of the uh, impressive achievements that's happened over the, the last 40 years, but are there areas of improvement that you saw? Right. I mean, if you, let's just pick up on what Dean said about agriculture. I mean, essentially, you've got a country that's still 85% rural, where about three to four million people derive at least some income from cocoa and coffee. And I, I began by saying, you know, today there's 60% more coffee production than there was at Independence, 25% more cocoa. But if you scratch that surface a little bit, it's not a pretty picture. I mean, what you see, and I was just up in Mount Hagen, for example, two weeks ago, right before the Independence celebrations, you know, you visit family farms that are growing uh, coffee, for example, and you see trees that are 20, 30, sometimes 40 years old, as old as the whole country. And they're, they're really pretty scrawny. You've got maybe 10, 15 cherries on a tree that should be carrying hundreds. So what you have is a lot of people that are maintaining sort of a, a toe in the, in the coffee production sector, but they're not running their, their farm as if it were a real source of continuous income and livelihood. And if you, you could produce a multiple, I mean, many times a family farmer on the same amount of land by replanting the, by rejuvenating the coffee trees, for example you could be producing much, much more. And it is a matter of education. It's a matter also of, of course, having the supporting infrastructure, the access roads, the electricity, the processing facilities, et cetera. But, you know, if you're going to, you know, we talked, Ben did, about where the jobs are going to be coming from. Part of it is being more productive in agriculture and then building on that to process the, the yields of agriculture. That's where the jobs are. They're there, they're in tourism, they're in services, but they're not so much in mining, where you're going to have a few very well-paid jobs but mining doesn't tend to generate enough jobs for a country like, uh, like PNG. Mm. Okay, before we go to questions, um, let's briefly talk about the Vision 2050 document. So this was a document that was developed by the Samara government in 2009. Um, and to quote um, Mr. Samara at the time, he, he said, we leaders and people must know where we want to go before we can decide how we should get there. Uh, what, Cecilia, can I start with you? What do you think about the Vision 2050 document? I mean, summarise it for us first and then give us your view. Um, Vision 2050 is, is actually a, a strategic plan, a 40-year strategic plan for Papua New Guinea. It, the, the, the vision is that between 2010 and 2050, we would develop, we would, we would address the seven pillars um, such that by the year 2050, we will be a smart, wise, fair, and happy society. Now, that's a mouthful, but we need to make it work. Uh, they, the, the, the task force that put that together on behalf of the government uh, put it in, in the form of um, the seven pillars. Now, the seven pillars I see as seven strategic objectives. The first one is human capital, um, youth and people empowerment, human capital development. The last one is to do with strategic planning, to actually continue to get involved in strategic planning and implementation monitoring. <coughs> and then in between there's defense and there's environment and the, the others I, I 
you cannot list the, the model off by heart. But it, I think it's a very good plan because it actually is derived from our, our um, five national goals, uh, directive principles, which were put together at the time when uh, we were pre preparing for uh, independence and, and we put together our um, constitution. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's a, I, I think it's a very good document. What makes me happy about it is the fact that both sides of the house have accepted it. The the, the bureaucrats and the whole the whole society at least, um, and those of us in in the education system have taken very seriously the first pillar because, as you as I mentioned earlier, um, we cannot do the other seven without addressing the first one, which is to educate our people. And I believe that if we educate our people um, at every level of education, from, from the technical to, to tertiary level, that to schools, starting in the schools, uh, then we're not going to realize our plan by 2050. But I always say that to the young people when I'm speaking to them that this vision is for the young people. I say it's for you and your children and your grandchildren because I've lived mine. <laughs> yeah, in, in Papua New Guinea context, I have worked for 40 years, I'm ready to retire. But I encourage them to take ownership of this plan, this strategic plan, and make it work. Mm. But at the moment, before I retire, I'm helping to educate the younger ones who will actually um, benefit from a clear direction of where we are going and what we need to do to get there. And let's hope you'll be around for many more years, <laughs> Cecilia. Ben, do you agree with Cecilia? It, it sounds like it's a very positive document that has widespread support politically. Do you think it is achievable? Yeah, well, it's well, achievable would be, uh, I mean, I, I tend to see more, more idealistic, uh, more, more on an abstract level, but uh, with the, how we are going with the uh, development of human resources, obviously we are making, you know, huge uh, steps towards, uh, you know, empowering people with education skills, uh, but it has to be pragmatic, applied. I mean, 85% of the people obviously live in villages, uh, isolated from whatever happens in Waigani. So uh, in terms of transmitting in terms of uh, you know making it more practical like the agriculture you have uh, Frank mentioned of uh, pe people could even develop more on the agriculture I mean a piece of land that they have so that they can have constant supply of uh, money but uh, you know agriculture is obviously one of the pillars there but in terms of transmitting or tra transpiring or you know making it more practical uh, to the taste or to make it more applicable to the people, it's a huge step. I mean, the donors are there, obviously, tr trying to assist wherever they can. Uh, but uh, being a subsistence uh, economy, a dominated economy, people, uh, uh, although a lot has uh, improved in terms of uh, literacy skills, numerical skills, and understanding how the economy uh, works, uh, but in order to achieve things, uh, pl government uh, plans as the vision to people needs to be more easily understood. Uh, otherwise, it's it's an abstract stance alone. It's just a political document. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. I, like differ, mm. I think um, Vision 2050 is a great document. It's um, first and foremost, it's homegrown. We, I was not there at Independence, but when it was the Constitution was drafted, it was uh, homegrown, and they reflected on. Um, societies and other countries that were more similar to ours in Africa for example and likewise this vision 2050 document brings that element as well I don't know of any other country who's got uh, such a, um, a strategic vision and where he wants to go and we would like to get in a vehicle knowing where we're going to drive to instead of just getting in a car for a ride and this is what vision 2050 is Mm. And having that goal, it might be a little bit abstract for the moment, but it's the general direction in which we're going. And of course, the destination might change a little bit because you've got to stop, you take a pit stop here and do that on the way, but you'll get to exactly where you want, which is um, those big uh, words Tell that us. Cecilia, that uh, she said about being wise and happy and healthy yeah. and fair and happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it looks like, uh, it sounds like that... Um the document has won, won you over, and as Cecilia <laughs> says, it is for the future generation. So that's a, that's a good start. Let's uh, open to questions now. Um, so those in Sydney and, and abroad, please uh, feel free to send them in. Um, fr uh, Franz, we have a question directed for you from the PNG mm -hmm. office. Um, P 
PNG may be richer in monetary terms, but how has that translated into human development? Um, it hasn't. It hasn't fully. I mean, if you take, yes, PNG is richer in, in income than it was in independence, about 60% richer. But um, that growth in incomes hasn't been enough to really dent poverty. The most fundamental human development measure, of course, is just whether people are, are escaping poverty, whether they have enough for nutritious uh, meals uh, and, and basic needs. And basically, on the, best, on the basis of the best data that's currently available, poverty in PNG really hasn't changed since the mid-1990s. It's stuck at about 40 percent of, of basic needs poverty. So on that level, there hasn't been much, much development. I think on education, um, there's been a, a big push in the last couple of years, and I think very laudable and very, very much appreciated, to get kids in school. So the numbers in school are great now. They're 96 percent of primary age schools, kids' school are in, in school. But if you dig a little bit, only 10 percent of kids that actually graduate from primary school go on to secondary school, much less to the universities where, where Cecilia will be working for them. And there's this whole bulge of adults who've never had this chance. I mean, we, one, one of the things that came out of the um, uh, Household Income and Expenditure Survey in 2010, when you surveyed uh, PNG's population overall, 45% of all men in PNG and 57% of all women in PNG hadn't finished a single year of school. They may have set f uh, foot in a school, but they hadn't finished even one grade. So you've got this whole stock of people out there that has very, very little education. And you know, as you're bringing them into primary school, you start to change that. But this is a generational undertaking. So I think PNG has made a good start. It needs to develop that. And you could say the same thing on a lot of the physical assets in PNG. You have, you know, you have about twice as many kilometers of roads as you did at Independence. But a lot of towns are still really remote and cut off. Um, you have 13% electricity coverage right now. That's the lowest in the Pacific. A lot of, and it's not just households, it's also mines and other commercial users that have to self-supply right now. Water and sanitation coverage is lower than it was 25 years ago. And it's partly because the systems just haven't kept pace with population growth. It's just it's about 2.5%. So it's a big challenge. I, despite all this, I mean, I could just you know, repeat these statistics one after the other. But here's why I'm optimistic about PNG despite these challenges. And I think it's because PNG is in a group of countries that has the natural resource base to finance its development. The big challenge is how do you take what's in the ground, the mining assets, the, the natural gas, and other things, and turn it into human assets and physical assets? How do you turn it into healthy, educated people? And how do you turn it into roads, water supply, et cetera? And so there's, there's good stories on how to do that. They've taken one good step just uh, last couple of months is to set up a sovereign wealth fund, for example. So at least what's taken out of the ground, what's paid in royalties and, and, and taxes, at least is accounted for. Fifty percent of it flows into the sovereign wealth fund. We'd like to see that go up to a hundred. I know the government's is thinking of that, but at least you've taken that first step to say, let's be transparent and accountable with what's coming into the cash register. And then the next step is, when you take it out of the cash register, make sure that you get good education, good roads, etc. out of that. Excellent. Um, Can I sure. yes. interrupt? Um, I don't think it's fair to classify Papua New Guinea by the term poverty, looking at it as what we normally would perceive it in other countries, because it's quite unique and the resources that we have for subsistence living. So the term poverty must not be seen as people are going through trash or translated to if you're using money as an indicator. They've still got plenty of food, nutrition from other sources. Um, but other statistics are still good. <laughs> I think it's, it's correct, it's just interpret, could be interpreted a little bit differently for, for the case of Papua New Guinea. On the flip side, in terms of the Sovereign Wealth Fund and moving forward in terms of development, we, if we can introduce a higher paradigm which we try to achieve by going up there, we force changes that are holding us, uh, that will probably change the things that are holding us back, issues of a global scale, like um, marginalized population equality and things like that. We come out at the other end with empowered people, um, having lost all these bad things that are holding us back in terms of development. So say stimulating um, agriculture, which is my passion. That 
farmers pushing in money or giving them access to loans so that they, they want to do it. But you're telling them, look, if you want to get this loan, you've got to do this and that and provide proof that you're not abusing the marginalized population or getting, giving them an equal benefit in this. And then these things will drive this change for development in a positive way, and it'll be very sustainable. Excellent. Let's see if there's a question in Sydney. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Ted Wolfers. Um, I had a couple of questions which I think follow from the points just made. The first one, it seems to me that there's a problem about the kinds of statistics we're using. That, for example, uh, one of the positives of the Papua New Guinea education system is the disproportionate number of Papua New Guineans now going overseas and the skill loss that's involved. And so I want to look very much beyond the statistics of who's graduating to where they end up. And that might have very serious implications for government policies and for uh, foreign aid programs, for example. Uh, and I think that's, uh, when, when I look at the World Bank statistics and others, it, it's really quite worrying because the figures are so high, but clearly the people are able enough to get jobs all over the world. So, you know, and no one wants to stop them. But similarly, the disincentive to joining the public service, that increasingly the really good people are finding other ways of working in the public sector but not joining the public service. I think that's my first question. The other one is, which follows directly from what Dean was saying, was that I don't think that the poverty measures tell me anything I want to know, um, or very little that I want to know, that's perhaps put too strongly, but it seems to me that the issue in many parts of Papua New Guinea is not poverty but impoverishment. That people are actually falling further and further behind, not just healthy lifestyles, which is a real issue, but also behind aspirations. Mm. That in fact aspirations have changed massively and people are engaging in antisocial conduct in some cases, not because they're poor in the traditional measures that are being used, but because they're relatively impoverished compared to what they want. And I think, I, I, I think I'm just suggesting that it'd be very useful to hear the panel members talk about these kinds of issues and the kinds of measures that we might use to address these, what I would regard as very important issues. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. And let's start with the first point, um, the, the so-called brain drain, I guess. That's that many countries experience, developed and developing, but uh, it can particularly have an effect on those emerging countries. Ben, you feel quite strongly about this brain drain. Uh, what are your thoughts to this about it? Well, Bren, uh, <laughs> drain uh, <clears throat> obviously has to happen. I mean, obviously when there's a demand for labor, or you know, now that we are in a globalized world, people move and that's what uh, people are, uh, freely doing, uh, but uh, as I mentioned uh, at the outset, uh, there are all these uh, some 1,000 uh, plus uh, number of uh, Papua New Guinean miners in Australia, and uh, they've been exposed to you know uh, Australian style you know working arrangements, running mines, and with Australian employers working in all over the place in PNG mines. So they came here when the mining boom uh, started uh, uh, you know, a few years ago, and. Uh, so that needs to happen. I mean, it might not be a significant number for a lot of countries since migration has been a way of life for them. But for PNG, obviously, there is a vacuum, uh, you know, in terms of uh, for the years, you know, a country has built up all this skilled human labor and then they start to migrate. But uh, the PNG, I mean, the mining sector is capital intensive and uh, there's a dual salary and uh, expatriates and a bit more than the PNG counterparts and it goes for the public service and other things as well. So obviously those things are happening and uh, as uh, Ted was saying, I mean statistics are relating to that. Uh, those things are happening but uh, what's happening is uh, statistics is a development issue in PNG. Uh, policies are made in a vacuum, <laughs> supply of uh, labor or uh, graduates to the labor market or demand for it is at least the reliable statistics is not there. The statistics, reliable statistics is a development issue. It's not aiding uh, the development issues in terms of good quality uh, policy uh, mm. making. And uh, unless and until we reconcile that major issue in terms of uh, what we want to achieve with quality figures, we won't be able to achieve the vision 2050 stuff that uh, 
we talked about. And uh, to run a country on a complex scale with, you know, ma matching good statistics with good policy, it's, it's a huge challenge. And uh, a lot of documentations have been done for the need to come up with reliable statistics. Obviously, we have the statistics obvious, but uh, it's, it's not, not happening. Okay, so it sounds like it's, a, it's quite a divisive, potentially divisive issue in terms of how you, you uh, relay the development of a country. But let's move on to another question from uh, Solomon Islands, directed at Cecilia. Uh, how can the government use the income it enjoys from the resources sector to better invest in PNG's education? The, the government needs to, to um, direct or manage the funds carefully in, in, in such a way that uh, the different levels of ed education can be addressed. So, for example, higher education has been underfunded for the last maybe 20 years or so, as far as I can remember. Uh, the, the government needs to be able to um, fund more education, more, more of higher education. In the, uh, recently, the government, as well as our development partners, uh, decided that they should fund general education. And now I think you know, after 10 years they realize that they need to actually pay a bit more attention towards higher education because they, they build up the, the, the general education and then they became that, 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 uh, that blockage. And so they, something else has to happen. So investment in higher education is, is, is critical yeah, I, I, in, in my view. The, the more funds need to go to the rehabilitation of infrastructure Salaries for academic staff, I think the point that Professor Wolfers was alluding to was why are the people going overseas? The, the, the salaries are, 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 are not uh, equitable, they're not, not, not fair. Yeah, the, the dual base salary system um, in, in the public sector is not working. Can you just, sorry to interrupt, can you explain the, the dual based wage system? Uh, the dual base system, some people will tell you that they, the, the dual base system is no longer there. Yeah. Um, that is a matter of debate because I've been there since independence and I know that it is still there. Um, the, the dual base system is where in, in the colonial days, the colonial administration actually set a, set a different set of salaries. Actually, the, the Australians had one system, the, 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 uh, the, the British people had one system, the New Zealanders had one system, Papua New Guineans had one system. Now, that it, was, it was that way in the colonial days because there were very few educated Papua New Guineans. That legacy, unfortunately, in my view, has continued. Um, disguised in different forms. They will, they, they, right, like right now, for, for academics, they have uh, domestic market allowance and, um, and, and, uh, and, and international market allowance. They say, for example, unless Papua New Guineans can demonstrate that they are marketable overseas, um, that, that they must continue to get a domestic market allowance. We know now clearly from what Professor Wolfers is saying that Papua New Guineans are quite marketable overseas. We have on our table here on, the, on my right is, is Dr. Imbun, who, who actually is working overseas. He's working as a senior lecturer uh, at, the, uh, at the university in Australia. Um, I myself worked for an Australian university in the United Arab Emirates a few years ago, 10 years ago. 10 years ago now, um, we Papua New Guineans are working overseas. So you know, to say that, that, that Papua New Guineans are not marketable internationally uh, is really a, a big issue for debate. They, they have now, the, 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 the advocates of the, the, those who say things are fair now is because we have now a, a single line base, but then it is differentiated by this domestic market allowance and international market allowance. Um, which then brings back the whole thing. It tries to disguise it, but um, if you understand our, our, our salary structure, is that is 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 not fair at all. So that's why a lot of Papua New Guineans are, are dissatisfied about that. That's why they go overseas. Mm -hmm. Our academics are leaving the universities, and now it is a big struggle to actually to to have people teach at the universities. Uh, because they are, they, they, the salaries are, are not good at the universities, so they are going into private enterprise where they can actually get a higher salary. So that, that's, that's all that worries. That sounds like yeah. a big challenge. Uh, do we have another question in Sydney? Sir. Uh, Jonathan Pryke from the Lowy Institute. Um, in the last 40 years since independence, PNG's population has slightly more than doubled from just under 3 million to just over 7 million. Best estimates have, in the next 40 years, PNG's population anywhere between tripling and quadrupling in size. Now, 
considering that the vast majority of this population increase will be happening in rural areas, can the Wontok system survive? And if not, or even if it can survive, what reforms need to take place to increase the agricultural productivity to uh, allow the system to, to remain intact with this population growth? Thank you. Dean, would you like to answer that? Yes, I could. <coughs> I'll try. <laughs> Very nice question. Um, yes, so that is a big challenge for us moving forward. And I sort of touched it briefly. I'll say that again. Um, that our agriculture needs to evolve now to appreciate that our, the basket that we're trying to feed is a lot bigger than what it is. The Wantok system will still evolve. I'm your Wantok, <laughs> and we can start from there. <laughs> um, it is now not people that are speaking the same language, which was the traditional meaning of Wantok, because they talk the same language, the one language, to people that they know. And communication and social media and everything else that is coming out is putting people together in touch with each other more. People with common ideals are now one talks. Now getting them out of poverty, using, or not poverty, but impoverishment or whatever you want to call it, moving, moving forward with agriculture is sort of, um, I tried explaining, uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll try to put it this way. What we have here, with what we're getting from the extractive industry sector, we're poor. We share this, and we'll all, be, we'll all be equally poor. We need to get something else in. We need to stimulate our own economy for growth, to empower people, to achieve more. And that is through things like our, our agriculture, and this will engage our rural population more, 85% of the people. Now, 3% of the land in Papua New Guinea is owned by the government. The rest is owned, traditionally owned. We need to get people to understand the concept of immobilizing land to be uh, better participants and beneficiaries of this resource that is their land. Um, the concept of the special agriculture business lease, it's a great concept. I don't think it has been understood clearly and definitely has been um, abused. Thank you abused by people that understand that system and are using it for other things. If we can manage that, it, it can easily work. And the rural population get a, a better benefit, and the investor comes in with a lot more confidence because we've got land, it's being on lease to us for a really long period, there's not going to be tribal issues and people taking that land away. We can invest more, create more jobs in the rural economy, get more, more of those youths involved, the country will grow. But we have to get them to understand all these concepts. That's where education comes back in. Frank. I could just uh, build on what Dean was saying, just in answer to the question. I mean, there are approaches to increasing agricultural yields that work, and they work right now in PNG. I'm happy to say the government has a program called Productive Partnerships for Agriculture, and we're very proud to be supporting that as the World Bank. But the basic idea is this. You bring together farmers groups with extension agents, a lot of times with buyers of whatever those farmers are going to produce downstream, and you basically have them put forward a proposal, but not just a proposal by any one party, but sort of an integrated proposal of the buyers, the producers, the extension agents, etc. And then government uses grants to basically invest in that group. So, for example, uh, make available a grant to them to cultivate new seedlings for cocoa or coffee or graft, um, graft new trees, etc. That works. Right now there's several tens of thousands of, of farmers in PHG that are being supported under these grants. The problem is in rural areas, as we've heard, it's 85% of PNG's population. So you need to take that up an order of magnitude to be at real scale. But there are approaches that are working right now. And there is, you know, even if you have a tripling or a quadrupling of the population, this is an extremely fertile country in many parts. It's very sparsely populated, even if you triple or quadruple the population. So the productive potential is there. I think it's really it's just a matter of, of unleashing it, and, and it can be done, right? Yeah, if I can just sure, uh, yes. uh, shed some light on uh, the stubbornness of the subsistence farmers to extend the land or to make it more economical, is simply uh, because, uh, I mean, it's tribal land or it's communal land or it's family land. So somebody, the father who actually owns a plot of land on which the coffee trees are grown, uh, cannot, you know, extend it and, uh, you know, enlarge it on the basis of a coffee prices because he needs to consider the family members that are probably five sons or three sons and they would be getting married and obviously they will settle on the land so those things are really playing a huge 
part. So uh, the divide between uh, cultural imperatives, traditional imperatives, yeah, that's and right. That, that's where the challenge the is. macroeconomic. Uh, mm. And trying to make sense yeah, interesting. out of what's happening. Um, can we go to a question now from Timor Leste, and this one's for Cecilia. Oh, in your view, what is the biggest lesson that Papua New Guinea has learnt that can be applied to other newer countries like Timor Leste? Um, we still have a lot of challenges, but I think the. For me, I mean, I always come back to this 2050 vision, but I, the, the fact that we actually have a vision for the future, I mean, I am, I, I'm also passionate about strategic planning, and I think that we, we actually need to create our own future. And this, the, this plan is, is our attempt to create our own future by saying this is where we want to get in 40 years' time from 2010. Um, how are we going to get there? These are all the things we have to address in order to get there. And I, I think that the, to actually start to plan or to envision our future and then work out what we mean by you know, achieving that future, what the success mean, what we see you know, in the future, that's what we think success is. So we need to work on, work in, in, on, on, on that success, success, success uh, achievement in the future. I think the idea of, of strategic planning and thinking is a lesson that I would like to actually recommend to other smaller nations, to think strategically, to know what you want, and then work hard. So it actually is working hard. Right now, PNG, um, I'm not sure whether we actually know what it means to work hard, but in order for us to actually achieve our vision, we must work hard. To be happy and fair and smart, we must work hard. And so there is an element there that we don't mention very often, is working hard. So we're going to teach ourselves how to work hard and teach the younger people how to work hard. And I recommend to the other smaller nations to also teach their people to work hard. Excellent. Adding on, um, mm. appreciating Vision 2050 <laughs> again, that's, that's a long-term goal for the 40 years. We also have a medium-term development plan, which is every five years. So it puts us to try to achieve those goals and more. And then, of course, the short-term plan, which is every year, that like, by the end of this year we try to achieve this. It will fit into our five years and eventually our bigger plan. So I think moving on from uh, an advice to our friends in Timor Leste is having a plan like that, but also putting in monitoring and evaluation indicators in between to, to see where you're going all along. Sound advice. Okay, is there another question from Sydney? No? That's, that's okay, because we've got many from overseas. <laughs> uh, we've probably got time for a couple more. So. There's another question here from Port Moresby. This is open to um, anyone in the panel, but we might just get one person to answer it. So development partners have been pouring aid into PNG to develop various sectors. Now, 40 years after independence, there's no evidence of, adequately tra of an adequately trained workforce. Uh, why do you think that is? I guess that that's your area of expertise. So despite... Despite uh, the development agencies and the, the aid that PNG received, um, is there a workforce to reflect that, that investment? I mean, obviously, the, the, the aid donors have actually come in a, a big way and they continue to support us, Australian aid, European Union, uh, World Bank. I'm, I'm not sure you guys are donors. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the, there is a place for, for them. I mean, the Vision 250, we cannot achieve... Uh, without uh, donors, so they, they have uh, continued to relieve the PNG government of its major uh, responsibilities. Uh, having said that, there's been a lot of criticisms on the donors as well of bringing in uh, consultants and uh, a third of, you know, fifth of the you know, expenses are paid on them and uh, uh, those things go on, but we cannot develop the country without uh, them. So. Obviously, they are you know, absolutely necessary to partner the PNG government in, uh, in, uh, in achieving those goals. But, uh, uh, yeah, their con uh, contribution has been uh, tremendous. Uh, where the government has failed in terms of providing uh, markets uh, for women and children to sell their produce. Uh, those of you who have been to Mount Argan, uh, there's a big market, uh, uh, the biggest in the country, or, I mean, put up by Australian aid. So the, the PNG government concentrates on other bigger things, and uh, these are things where, in terms of funding the H HIV and AIDS programs, uh, uh, the donors have actually come in a big way. 
And uh, if it wasn't for them, obviously, uh, we wouldn't uh, progress the way we have. So there's still very much room for development partners and donors. That's right, yeah. A big room, bigger room, yeah. Okay, before we end the discussion, um, can I just ask each of you briefly, uh, what's your outlook for Papua New Guinea? Is it a, a good one, a bad one in between? Um, can I start with you, Dean? Thank you. <coughs> obviously, it's going to be a good one. I'm excited to be part of it. Um, I see a lot of positives. Obviously, there have been negatives, but that only means that um, we have a lot of room for improvement. I really believe the best is yet to come. Cecilia? Yeah, I, I am very positive about the future of PNG. Um, yeah, I, I, I believe that um, we have already started, but I believe that we will be the leader in the Pacific region. Uh, this, with, just by the mere fact that we are big, we have more people, we have more challenges, but we are able to overcome our challenges. We can teach the smaller nations, you know, a thing or two about development issues. But we, we have a bright future. We have resources. We have our people. We have we, we have seven million, more than seven million people, and growing. Mm -hmm. If we can educate all of them, you know, Papua New Guinea has a bright future ahead, and we will be the, the leader in the Pacific region. Friends. I think Papua New Guinea is perched on the edge of an opportunity. I think for the next 40 years, Papua New Guinea could, if it plays its cards right, really take off. And I think the amounts of money that it could spend to take off aren't necessarily even that big. Let me just give you one example. Right now, if you take internet connectivity, that's something that's been a big enabler of development in many countries, that's exploded recently, but it's all basically wireless. So, you know, in 2009, only 20% of Papua New Guineans lived in an area where they had 2, 2G um, mobile connectivity. Now it's 90%. That's six years of, of development. It's not 40 years, it's just the last six. The big thing is that fiber optic cables, for example, only reach Port Moresby and Madang right now. For less than $100 million, which relative to the size of the economy isn't really a huge amount of money, you could reattach Papua New Guinea to the world. The existing cables are, are aging. You could run a cable along the entire coast. You could collect you know, Papondetta, Ley, Insular PNG, New Britain, New Ireland, etc. You could do it for a relatively affordable amount and get broadband cable to huge fractions of the population. And doing that would just open so many opportunities in terms of businesses that could open and market themselves on the web, educational opportunities that are suddenly available in the interior, and it doesn't even take that much money. So I think, you know, with good technical advice, we're happy to be part of that technical advice. There's certainly many others that can help provide it. I think PNG is really poised with great opportunities, and we, I guess our commitment is to help them uh, make the most of those opportunities. And Ben, uh, where do you see yeah, Papua well, New Guinea? I, I equally share the view of uh, PNG having a robust, uh, a bright uh, future, uh, but the Obviously, the missing link, or provided that we have good leadership uh, for many developing countries, Singapore is already a developed country now, but Malaysia and others have singular endedly been put up by people with uh, that recent 250 uh, similar arrangements, but with decisive leadership, pragmatic leadership, speaking to the people. Obviously, Papua New Guinea 85 percent uh, oblivious to what uh, happens around with bureaucrats with Vision 250. Uh, so what we need is uh, some dynamic, so the lead, some good leader understanding the masses of the people where they live in villages. I mentioned of the agriculture plot where uh, those mentalities need to be broken down, where people need to be absorbed into the more uh, broader, you know, economy, formal economy. That's where the stumbling block is. Unless somebody taps into that and understands the people and uh, preaches uh, to them about how it means to be educated, means to earn a living and then bring up the kids and go forward, then I do not, uh, after 40 years probably there would be another session here talking about <laughs> what have we achieved in the last 80 years. So leadership is uh, number one, I mean number one meaning. We need to have some of those notable leaders that have turned their countries around. Papua New Guinea needs by now to come up with somebody, single-handedly or a group of people to, 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 do, to do that. Okay, interesting times. Maybe we will have a, a discussion 40 years from now to see how it all went. But for now, that does bring our discussion to an end. Can we please thank our panellists, Benedict Imbun, Franz Dries Gross, Cecilia Nembu and Dean Waruba.
I'd also like to thank everyone joining us either here in Sydney or from afar. And remember, you can view this or any of the other Praxis discussions at worldbank.org forward slash Praxis. Until next time, I'm Oscar Sabakti. Thanks for your company. Bye for now.